Hello and welcome back to the What The Fork podcast in association with Viper Goalkeeping. Today's guest is a young goalkeeper who came through the ranks at Aberdeen and currently finds himself the number one at Falkirk FC. Welcome to the show, Robbie Much. How are you doing, Paul? You all right? Yeah, not bad, mate. Yourself? Yeah, I'm all right. I was going to use the introduction, are you up to much? But I thought it was a little bit too obvious of a pun that. <laughs> no, I get that in the papers a lot. There was there was one actually a season we played our broke in the Scottish Cup and it was in the sun, obviously. And I spent a bit of time alone at Arbroath under the same yeah. current manager. And the headline was, I learned so much M-E-T-C-H from Dick, Dick Campbell. I was thinking they've done me over here. But it's pretty good, to be fair. Uh, journalist to journalist. That just sums him up. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose first things first, before we delve into the past, let's chat about the present. Uh, we're currently speaking in. 15th of July, but back in March, I think as everyone across the world knows, COVID hit, but at the time, Falkirk sitting in second in the league, one point behind Wraith Rovers with Wraith to play at home. COVID hits, season's curtailed, Wraith get promoted, Falkirk stay where they are. How do you react when you see that news and what are your thoughts on it? Um, initially, I was I was raging, to be honest. That we, I don't know what to say because, on hindsight, football probably couldn't have been played out. But the way I think they've just ended the leagues and given it to who was top, I think it was unfair. Um, I feel like the SFA wish that League One was had a clear runaway because Celtic top of Premiership were miles ahead, United top of Championship miles ahead, and I think it was Cove League Two were miles ahead. But whereas we were only a point with goal difference as well, but I think it was just we were just gutted to not get the chance. To be honest, who knows? We might not have ended up going on to win the league. Let's let's be real, but we just, we didn't get an opportunity. I think everybody was looking to that last game against Wraith and buzzing for it to possibly be a whoever whoever wins this takes all. Did you find out in advance that that was going to happen? Because I know, like, there was like murmurs as a Sunderland fan. There was murmurs for a while that it was going to be weighted point per game, and we were going to be screwed. Um, but as a team, do you do you find out when the fans find out, and when it's officially confirmed, or do you hear murmurs um, beforehand? Yeah, seen it on Twitter. Seen it on Twitter at the same time as everyone else. Now we we didn't get told to anything. Even in our group chat with the managers and that, there was questions asked by some of the other boys, or oh, if they heard anything, what's happening? And they're like, no, nope, not a clue. No, nope, We know as much as as you guys. Is it even an option to, I mean, I don't know, but was it even an option to, to fight it or would you want to fight it? It's like, how, how do you, you take that news on board and I suppose in a sense on the face of it, there's not much you can do. So how do you, how do you progress to the next stage? What, what is it you do next? Um, well, to be fair, our chairman, he's been very vocal about it in that, in what he said, he was like, I'd rather spend our money on recruiting players or whatever, I might use the money on the playing squad to go and challenge for the league next season and use it for courts and solicitors and all that. So he's been pretty vocal on what he's wanting to do, which is, is fair enough. We'll probably... As players, the ones that are left from last season, we'll use that as motivation now to go and hopefully make sure we're clear at the top of the league next season. And then we're the ones that are good in the league next season. But yeah, we, we've just got to use that as motivation now. It's a bit of a shame as well for Falkirk as a club. I think we were just saying off, off air, I was... I used to live in Glasgow, friends with a, a lot of Falkirk fans and one particular big Falkirk fan. And obviously... There was the the dropping through the leagues a little bit, and obviously that's disappointing. And it's hard for any fan base, and I know that as a Sunderland fan. But it felt like there was like something coming back up. There was even a period I think where there was almost a takeover by someone who tried to take over Sunderland. I think it was Mark Campbell at the time yeah. tried to take something over. That hasn't really worked out. Um, probably for, from a Falkirk fan's perspective, it seems that they're quite happy about that. Um, so it's been a period of uncertainty that you got back on your feet, ready to go onwards. But like you see, you can use that as motivation, can't you, moving forward? It definitely is. If that can't motivate you, what can, I suppose? Injustice always yeah. motivates people, doesn't it? Yeah, well, exactly. Just as I said, that will be the motivation. Well, for me, anyway, for next season, obviously, hopefully going back is number one after playing the majority of last season. That would be my motivation to not only stay in the team, but to, to go back and hopefully win the league this year round. 
I think since the decision itself, we've touched on it a little bit as well, but things have gotten quite wild within Scottish football, I suppose, at the time of speaking. Um, things are as they are. Teams are promoted the way they are. Teams have been relegated the way, the way it was originally announced. But there's loads of rumours of like promotion overturns, court cases and all sorts of stuff. I suppose my question to that would be, what's it like to be involved with the craziness of Scottish football at the moment as someone directly involved with things that yeah. this could affect? Well, a bit like the announcement. I, t- I know as much as the fans in that, eh? Um, yeah. We're all just sitting back and kind of watching what's going on. Nobody really knows knows anything. You're hearing all this with Hearts and Partick and all that with the courts and that, and it's it's dragging on. Obviously, Hearts aims to still be a Premiership team for next season, obviously hoping things go their way, but the Premiership season starts in two weeks on Saturday. So it's it's chaos, to be honest, but... What can you do? Never born in Scotland, is it? No, you're right. There's always something going on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so I suppose moving all the way back then to less present and going all the way back into your past, making me feel a bit old here, but you're born in 1998, which is 12 years after me, um, in <laughs> Elgin. I've actually been Elgin, um, randomly enough, but what was life like growing up in Elgin? Obviously incredibly far north, so what was life like growing up? Um... I don't know, because I only lived in Elgin for like a year, I'm sure. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> I moved I moved to just outside of Aberdeen, Inverurie, a wee place called Inverurie. Yeah. So that's where I was that's where I grew up. Um just outside of Aberdeen. Well, my dad was born there anyway, so he, he grew up in Inverurie, but I think we were all living in Elgin because of his work. I, I think that's his story anyway. I'm not actually too sure, but yeah, grew up just outside of Aberdeen. In, is Inverurie the place that has that really old haunted jail, or am I making that up? I went on a ghost tour once, and it was like an old haunted jail. I'm sure that was Inverurie. I don't think so. It might be Bankery. I'm sure there's a place in Bankery. It's, I think that's a hospital. I'm not actually sure. The only jail there is, I think there's a big one up in Peterhead. It's like a museum and all that now, but no, it's definitely not Inverurie. <laughs> I probably didn't plan that whatsoever. I should have probably fact-checked that, but I didn't know you were going to say that, to be <laughs> fair. Um, so, obviously, just outside of Aberdeen, Aberdeen, huge football club. I know, as it is, you are an Aberdeen fan, uh, but I think everyone has that story of when they first discovered football and there's a reason we all love it and play it and follow it and do podcasts on it, but what were your experiences of, like, your first discovery of football? Um, well, obviously, my dad's an Aberdeen fan, so I just followed in his footsteps. Um I can't even. I think my first Aberdeen game was a European tie against. Was it Union Berlin? They're called. Was that yeah. the team in Germany? Yeah. I can't even remember the score. What the game was like. I can't remember anything. I typed it, but I just somehow remember that being my first game. Um, but I was I was in the youth academy from quite a young age. Like Aberdeen's from. I think it was from about eight. So we used to get given free season tickets. Like every youth player got two free season tickets for the family stand at Aberdeen. So every Saturday my my dad was probably more buzzing than I was to get them to get free <laughs> tickets in Aberdeen game. Anyway, we went every Saturday pretty much and yeah, I've just I've always been a massive Aberdeen fan. It's funny that if you got free season tickets at Aberdeen and your dad's like an Aberdeen fan, was it a case of like if you had three or four of the clubs, your dad was just like, I think Aberdeen might be the best choice, son. I think you should probably go to Aberdeen think of those free tickets. <laughs> well, I always wanted to be an Aberdeen player. Eh? And I, to be fair, I got that from when I was eight years old until I was 18, three years full time as well. So only level did they play at was first team, which is obviously gotten, but who knows? There might still be time for that one day. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, you mentioned before about you went there when you were eight, and I was reading that, and obviously when you're doing that research on people in their youth careers and stuff, a lot of clubs, no matter which era of person you're speaking to, tend to go to a club when they're about 11, 12 sometimes, and that's like really early, but eight-year-olds, like incredibly early. So, you know, who was it that decided that you were going to be a goalkeeper? Who was it that noticed your talents, and how do you get to a club that early? Um... I don't even know how I became a goalie. I think it's because I wasn't actually very good at football. I got <laughs> I got put in, in nets. Um, that's what I've always said anyway. I was never never good enough to play outfield, so I got shoved in goals at my boys' club team. Um, but to be fair, I, I enjoyed it, I guess. Um, height's always kind of been on my side as well, so I think 
when they were struggling to find a goal, you're like, right, Robbie, and you go, you're the biggest in that. I think that was just the kind way to put it, yeah, shite outfield, so your bigs go and goals. Um, but yeah, I was I only played boys club for a year. My local Inverurie team, Colney, were called. So I played there for a year and then Aberdeen picked me up. Mind going for my first trial. Um, and it was a, just a field, a park in Aberdeen. I'll always remember that. Um, and there was a few few of us. I think it was me, a boy called Aaron Norris and a boy called Frank Ross. And all three of us were there that night and grew right up together, up through every level. And all three of us went full time at the same time. And unfortunately, that was Frank just released for Aberdeen just last week. Yeah. So that was uh, the last one of our little group remaining at the club that, that got released. But he was lucky enough, he got his chance at first team. Actually, I remember he scored a free kick against Rangers um, a couple of seasons ago, but he's been really hard done by by injuries, to be fair. To him. But yeah, that was our, our little group. And now it was brilliant growing up, playing with him week in, week out, and training with them, and coming out right through the ranks, and one of us got to play first team. It's funny when you're talking about um, like people that you, you grew up with and stuff, and obviously you, you've mentioned before you moved out of Elgin pretty fast, but one thing I did notice, when you would have been around seven or eight, Andy Gorham was turning out for Elgin, I think, in about like 2003. Oh, really? One of the greatest Scottish goalkeepers ever. So who were your like idols growing up then? This is going to sound really uninspiring, but the current Aberdeen goalie at the time it was Jamie Langfield. Yeah. <laughs> um, he used to get bad press by Aberdeen, but I loved him when I was a kid. I used to love going to watch, and in my first season full time, he was actually still the goalie. So I got a year, a year training with him, which was I was fifteen when I first went full time. So I was, I was buzzing basically when I signed, and I was getting to train with basically who I've grown up watching every week. So, yeah, that would have been my idol when I was a kid, but probably a bigger name, Van der Sar, was the yeah. goalie I loved, I loved watching because that's my English team, Man United. Um, again, just following my dad, he's a Man United fan as well. Um, but I always link Aberdeen and United together with, obviously, Alec Ferguson going to Aberdeen to Man United. So, it's not like I'm a glory hunter or whatever. Or at least there's a, there's a link between the, the two teams. I think my my uh, my love for Aberdeen would all come from Chris Maguire. Just love Chris Maguire. <laughs> Greatest guy That's ever. Right, but... yeah, I grew up watching him as well. Yeah, he was he was he wasn't bad when he was young either. But I don't think he's I don't think his attitude on the pitch has changed very much from what I've seen. He was a, a little shit then. He's a little shit now. But he's our little shit. So <laughs> you've got to say you, you like him when he's on your team. But when you moved to going back to sort of growing up with with Aberdeen, now. I can only look at it from maybe a media perspective, say, working for Sunderland, that would be surreal for me. But then you look at being a player is completely different. But I was just touching on before, it's normally like when you're like 12 or 13, when you've got that kind of grasp of watching football for five or six years and that's your club. But when you're eight, like, I mean, God, I can't even remember when I was eight, it's that long ago. But at what point do you start kind of clicking on that you're at like one of the biggest clubs in Scotland and the club that you support? Do you get that straight away? Do you get the feeling of like it being surreal immediately or does it come at a later date? Um, probably not at that age. I was, obviously I was happy to be, it was weird because obviously you go from playing with your, your schoolmates every day and uh, playing with them at a weekend to playing with probably the best players at that age in the in the region, like in the city, in the Shire and that. Um, but no, you didn't. I don't think so. Um, I think it was probably a bigger thing for my family at the time, but I didn't yeah. picked up by by them. But it was probably when you reach like under 15s and then under 17s level, you're like really close. You're only one more step away if they go in full time with the club. That's probably when it started getting a bit like, right, this is getting serious now. But at that young age, probably not, because when you first go in, I think it's the first age group, I don't know what it is, under 10s or whatever, you play the local teams, so all the local boys clubs teams, right. but you play them like a year above. So if we were under 10s Aberdeen, we'd go around to playing all the local under 11s teams. Um, but I mind just 
beating them every week. Eh? I wouldn't be touching the ball and that. Like the boys in front of me, eh? obviously it's the best kids in the city and that. And I was a goalie, not touching the ball every week. Well, that was probably the whole point of playing a team a year older than you to try and get challenged a bit more. But then I think it's after that you go and play like your Celtic Rangers, Hearts, Hibs, and all that, all the other pro youth teams and that. And I remember our first, my first ever game against like a Prem team was against Celtic. It was only like 10 or whatever at the time. And I mean, we got scalped like double figures. And I was thinking, holy shit. I was an eye opener at like 10 years old, getting beat 9 0 or whatever at Celtic, your first ever game. And obviously, a goalie as a kid getting nine past you. I was probably greeting in that after the game, no doubt. But yeah, that was it was good playing at that young age and that playing the big teams and playing for the team you support. When you come up against like the Celtic and Rangers and, and whatnot and uh, you know other clubs and, and Hamilton obviously at that level as well have a great youth system. Yeah, um, I always used to hate playing against Hamilton. Yeah. They won the league they again, played. didn't they? I think. Like What's recently. That? I think they won the youth league again, I think recently. Yeah, they're, they're ridiculous. They, they from their under tens to their first team, they play the exact same way. Absolute gang. <laughs> It's a good idea though, isn't it? I mean, that's the one thing I should probably touch on. When you're coming through at youth level, I remember um, when Gus Poy, it was at Sunderland, he put in this implementation that the way the first team played is the way that the under 18 should play. Does mm-hmm. it differentiate when you go through the levels when you were at Aberdeen? Did it go from like, play this way, to play that way? To play? I mean, and obviously the managers change, but is there an idea of how they want you to play so you can progress to the first um, team? Yeah, I think it was probably different every level. So every year you change your manager. So there was like two managers or whatever for every age group. And they wouldn't change their age group. The players would kind of go up the managers. How how the club worked that out, I don't know. But it was however those current managers wanted you, wanted you to play. And, uh, and they're obviously the ones making the decision for the next level. So... The under 12s managers, if they didn't like you, you wouldn't make it to the under 13s. And then, so basically, you've got to try and impress every every coach at every every level to make your way up. Would you prefer it that way to be like where you're learning? Technically, you could be learning like new tricks at every age group. Yeah. Or would you prefer the the continuity of like learning a style of football and sticking to it in a kind of Man City, Barcelona way, if that makes sense? Yeah, to be fair, I didn't mind it. I was getting new managers every season, but obviously being a goalie, I still had the same goalie coach and that, so it's probably slightly different from me. I'm still getting the same goalie coach every every year, but just different managers. So I didn't I didn't mind it to be fair. Who were your coaches going up? Um so it's all like youth academy coaches, but like the head of youth academy was Neil Simpson. So he's a massive Aberdeen legend in that. Um and the goalie coaches and that were just again youth academy goalie coaches but I've had them since I've grown up um, and I've got a lot to thank them for I suppose because it was the same goalie coaches I've had for when I first came in to when I left the club so uh, Keith Patterson his name is he's he's local um, when he left Aberdeen he actually went to Cove Rangers to goalie coach but that's who I probably got the most to give to um, is him because he was my goalie coach for probably about a decade, and obviously he's seen me growing up in that, and he still he still gets in touch regularly. He was actually at a few of my games for Falkirk last season in that, so it's good that I suppose when your youth goalie coach is still, is still well actually it was a game that we played Peterhead away, so pretty local game um, near Aberdeen. So he was at a game we won three one. And after the game, he says, well done, Robbie, good three points, blah, blah, blah. And 10 minutes later, I got a massive paragraph through my phone. He's like, right, I think you could have done this better, could have done that better than that. Your kicking was good, but your handling could have been better here or there. So he's, he's still wanting to wanting to coach me. <laughs> What's the best bit of advice that you were sort of given growing up? Not necessarily by him, it could be, but from anyone. Um, Just a, a cliche one, just try to forget your mistakes, I suppose. It's even... More so for a goalkeeper, you yeah. make a mistake, it's a goal pretty much. So it's dealing with that. It's the main thing, especially at a young age, like you know, youth games and that, if the scores are going to be seven each or whatever every Saturday. So you're conceding a lot of goals as well as making a lot of saves. So it's, I just kind of 
think they're trying to forget the mistakes and the goals and move on. It's quite a, I mean, it's the most lonely position on a football field, but I suppose if you're looking at that as a positive, as you're talking about growing up and stuff like that, I've always found like a lot of goalkeepers to be, I can't think of the word, but a bit crazy. Like they kind of have to be because they're kind of sticking their head in their foot in all sorts of places. Got to be really, really brave. But I mean, I've had, we've had Thomas Sorensen, I've had Paddy Kenny on recently, um, if we're talking goalkeepers union on the show. And especially Paddy Kenny's got some great stories about like bravery and getting stuck in and stuff like that, but also mental toughness that came with it. Um, in the sense that if you do make a mistake, it's remembered for like weeks. And there's the likes of like mm-hmm. Pe- Peter Engelman, I think, played for his country for Finland, but he gets remembered for like letting the ball go under his foot in the derby game. So yeah. when you're a goalkeeper and you make a mistake, growing up being that goalkeeper and being like that lonely position on the pitch, does it make you like grow up a bit faster mentally because you have to kind of just chuck those mistakes out of the way? Yeah. Yeah, you could say that, I suppose, but I've never known any different. I've just always been a goalkeeper, so yeah. as, as I said, I, I know no different. Um, I think that mis- oh, mistakes happen. You say that, you, you look at De Gea or whatever, every goal in that Premier League this season will have made a mistake. So It, it just comes with a job. It's just how you've got to react to it, I suppose. I've, like, I had a good season last season for Falkirk, but yeah, I've made bunch of mistakes that probably maybe don't get noticed as much because performances kind of overtake that but I notice them and my goalie coach notices them and that's when we sit down after every every game and, and go over I sit I could save a penalty get man in match but we'll sit down and we'll we'll go over all the mistakes that I've made in that and I think that's good especially when you're young because if you sit down and actually review what you're doing you tend to make their mistakes less less yeah. after you sit down and watch yourself watch yourself doing it so no you, you, you're right it is a lonely position but that's, that's why it's called the union I suppose isn't it you've got your goalie coach and that even even the other goalies at the club they, they support you, even if they're not playing in that so I relate to Cammy Bell and that I was I was playing ahead of him for a bit of the season in that and he was brilliant with me even though obviously you want to be playing he wasn't in Every every game in that he was in training, he's he's brand new with me, and he's obviously he was an experienced goalie compared to me, and he's it was like having two goalie coaches, an actual goalie coach, plus training with him. So it's good when you've got a good wee group around you. Talking about like when you you're working under goalkeepers, one thing I've always sort of wondered. So there's the goalkeepers union. There's only one position that's on the pitch. Cammy Bell was one I was thinking of. Cammy Bell's obviously played at Rangers, he's played at Killy, he's played at SPL clubs. It's like a young 21-year-old, 20, 21-year-old goalkeeper comes in, takes his place. It feels like goalkeepers themselves genuinely do have that goalkeeper's union where there is a good friendship, they're sometimes roomed together. Even if one of them is like out near the one and they want to play and everyone wants to play, it's almost like uh, because you play that position and because you understand the position and you understand there's only one position on the pitch, there's no real... Well, there is competitiveness, but how do you keep it competitive and friendly at the same time? Because goalkeepers seem to have that knack of being a yeah. really friends with their nearest rivals. Um, tough question, actually. <laughs> if, you're, if you're pissed off and you're, you're not playing that, you would never, ever take it out on in training with other goalie, with your goalie coach. If you want answers, you go... You go knocking the manager's door or whatever privately yeah. without anyone knowing, I suppose. But you would never show it or or take it out. Say like you're doing a warm up on a Saturday. Like we shake hands, give everyone a hug in that before before the game, and it's it's no different if you're on the bench or if you're playing. Everyone's there trying to get the same thing: three points and a clean sheet, I suppose. So no, it's obviously the first quarter of the season I didn't play. And I was thinking, shit, I'm 21. I've only got a year left in my contract and that, and I'm not playing um, in League One at this age and that. Um, what what do I do? So there was like serious doubts. What was what was I going to do in the January transfer window? I was I was thinking, about, I'm going to have to try and get out of here, otherwise my career could be in serious jeopardy. Yeah, but 
I managed, I was lucky enough to get in the team in that and I was thinking, oh no, this could probably upset the morale at training or whatever with, with the goalies. But as I said, Cam, he was, he was brilliant when, when I got in the team in that and you, you wouldn't know um, he was wanting to like really play like towards me. He was, he was so supportive in that and it was actually, it was a game, I think our goalie coach was ill. So he couldn't make it to the game. So it was just me and Cammy. And it was one of the first games I was in, in the team. So he took my warm up in that. But as I said, it was like having another another goalie coach. He was he was brilliant. One of the goalie coaches you had, I think I could be wrong with this, and you can correct me on it. But you I think 2017, 2017, 2018, when you were at Aberdeen, was it Jim Layton you were working under? Yeah. So I had three years full time at Aberdeen, and my first year full time it was Jim Layton. How good was he? He scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Why? Like, I, he, he scared me. I was, I was, I was probably soft as shit. To be fair, I was only fifteen when I went full time, and I wasn't used to it. Um, but no, he was, he was a good goalie coach, and obviously the career he's had, eh, however many caps for Scotland, played for Aberdeen, played for Man United, and all that. Um, probably nobody better you could get as a fifteen-year-old going in full time. But yeah. No, he, he did scare me, I, I will admit that. <laughs> but that's probably what you need. He, he was probably doing it on purpose. Um, mental toughness and all that as a kid. Um, he was, no, he was he was good. And I think he left Aberdeen just before the end of that first season. I was full-time. And it was a couple of years later. I think I was 18. And I got into the Scotland 21 squad. Yeah. And he was the Scotland 21's goalie coach. So I hadn't seen him for a couple of years. Obviously, like your national team's 21s, it's mostly full of first-team players. Um, so when I first met him again after getting into that squad, it, he was totally different with me. He he treated me as like a first-team player. Even though I wasn't a first-team player, he was treating me as a first-team player in that, and he was completely different with me. So that's what makes me think he, he did that on purpose when I was a kid, like proper, tough. So... I think his coaching methods and that were were right because he toughened me up as a fifteen year old. Yeah. What were kind of his methods that you can remember? What how would he kind of treat you when you were younger to how he would treat you sort of nowadays, who we say? Um basically don't catch a ball, right? Get doing do five press ups every time you don't catch a ball <laughs> or whatever. Whereas going with the twenty ones and that, he was he was just so chilled out and like, well, you're here for a reason and that, you're good enough, so you're going to get treated like a, a first team goalie, which the different, honestly, the difference was mental. But his his training was really old school in that. Um, it was tough. See pre season off. I've not had a pre season like it. That was my first ever like full time pre season, and to this day, one's not topped that. With him achieving so much in the game, and like you said, the amount of caps that he's had, like the tournaments he's went to, the trophies that he's won, does it almost immediately, even if you think, oh, what he's doing here, I don't really like, I'm not too sure on it, because he's won so much stuff and he's such a decorated character, do you go, well, he must be right? And then later on, obviously, you've been proven right, but at the time, do you think I should listen to him because the amount of, like, get your medals out, do you know what I mean? He's, he's won enough, yeah. well, he's no, done I enough. I never doubted him or whatever, I never doubted him, I always listened to to everything he, he told me because again I was I was a fifteen year old training with Aberdeen first team goalies and the goalie coach and that I, I would I don't think I'd say a word in training to be honest. I was too scared to actually open my mouth and that I would just keep my head down and and try and catch the ball, proper concentrate on something that's so natural to a goalie but he proper made you feel like you need to catch every single thing in that. But no he was no he was good and obviously as he said his career speaks for itself. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, you talk about the Scotland under twenty one squad, obviously that you got into. Who was it you were competing against at that point? Um, so what happened was I was in the Scotland nineteens, <coughs> and it was just a friendly game against Sweden. So we played Sweden at, at in Edinburgh, and I was red. Well, my dad was at the game because we were heading home after that game. It was the end of the camp. So yeah, I was ready to get back in the car with him. And uh, and my Aberdeen goalie coach, so the new one, Gordon Marshall, he was at the game as well. So I had my bags, I got my shower, I was waiting to get back in the car. And he, my goalie coach came over to me. He was like, oh, your dad's going to go back up to Aberdeen and get your passport. I was like, what for? He was like, oh, you're, you're going to wave the 21s now. And I was just like, 
because we'd just been beat by Sweden. I was, I think it was 2 1 or something. So obviously, my head was down after getting beat. And I was just like, nah, you're bamming me up. And he was like, no, you're going, you're going away now with the 21s. Um, I think it was, what did we, go? we went to Macedonia. That's where it was. And um, we were flying across to Macedonia. It was the last qualifying game to get into the 21s Euros. Yeah. I think it was. Um, obviously, I was only 18 at the time in the 21, so I knew I wasn't going to play or whatever. I was only going as like backup, but I was I was buzzing just to get in the 21s. It was it was quite surreal. So we went across to Macedonia, and Macedonia needed to win the game. It was like the first time that they could qualify for any tournament at any level. So I don't know what the stadium's called, but it was the stadium that hosted the Super Cup, I think. Yeah, a couple of years ago, Real Madrid. Someone I can't even mind what game it was, but anyway, it was that stadium. So it was a like 20,000, 25,000 seater stadium. We were in playing, and honestly, the whole of Macedonia turned up to the game <laughs> for, that, for that 21s game. Um, the whole stadium was packed. It was it was mental. The atmosphere, how loud it was for a 21s game. I couldn't believe it. I was thinking, wow. <laughs> I was on one to our both at the time. I was like, I'm I'm playing League Two football, and I'm sitting involved in a squad in front of 25,000 people it was I mean I, I didn't play or whatever but just the experience of being there and the atmosphere yeah even the squad at the time was like you had the likes of um, John Suter Jason yeah. Cummings and all that it was like a proper again first team squad so no it was what, a, what an experience it was I don't know how much experience you have with him but Jason Cummings is one of my favourite people that has probably ever existed <laughs> I don't know how long you had with him, but what was your experience with him? I was only in one squad with him, but it was him and Ollie McBurney that were in that squad, and their room shared, and they, they were just mental. Like, honestly, <laughs> you wouldn't think they were professional footballers. All they do is clean about it. was, I mean, hilarious some of the stuff they would do. I, I can't even tell you some of the stuff they would do because I wasn't there for that long, but... No, funny, I don't think I've ever laughed so much in my life in front of him too. We talked about the uh talking off air before we had Dylan McGeer on and obviously Dylan did the was the DJ for when he did the Grado thing. When he was at oh, Hibs. Yeah, yeah, at Hibs. And I just feel like do you know like if you could have Big Brother on a certain player, if you could just have Big Brother on like twenty four hour Jason Cummins yeah, TV, yeah. it would just be superb. But you know, you're looking at I mean, my girlfriend's um, someone who follows Scotland like home and away, and, and, and we've obviously I'm English, but I like to see Scotland do well because I have such an affinity with it. And looking at Scotland's team, we were discussing this the other day. A lot of those players from the under 21 level have gone into the first team, and Ollie yeah. McBurney is one of them. When you look at the Scotland team, as a player who's been involved in the Scotland under 21 squad and someone who I'm presuming is a Scotland fan, um, do you think that the quality that's in the Scottish a team like Scotland are kind of going into an era where you might have a bit more of an opportunity to go to tournaments and do something with like the likes of John McGinn and stuff like that. Yeah, I think so. You see a lot more Scottish players playing in the Premier League now. Um, yeah. Maybe say 10 years ago or whatever. Um, so who have you got? You've got like McTominay, John McGinn, Kenny McLean, obviously Ollie McBurney and that. There's a lot more Scottish players playing at the highest level now. Yeah. So hopefully things are looking up <laughs> I think I think I don't think it'll be long now until we get into a into a tournament but it has been a while I've never seen Scotland in a tournament I have but that's just because I'm old awesome, wasn't it? Yeah, and <laughs> and yeah. obviously that was the year I was born yeah um, looking at the, the Scotland team you know you're going through players like that as well and you've got like Robbo and whatnot. Uh, he's probably the best left back in the world I think we could say I think it's a fair yeah, assessment yeah probably so it does feel like it's it's getting to that point. Does that make you the experience that you had though, and seeing the quality that's going into the, the Scottish team, the quality that's coming from the under twenty one team, having that experience and playing alongside and being in amongst those kind of players, does that give you a hunger to get back into it and continue to kind of keep pushing for where you are at the moment? Yeah, so I was eighteen when I was in the squad and then Aberdeen let me go the same season I was in that squad and that was the last time I was in it. So I felt like with the youth academy and the youth um, Scotland setups and that it was a lot of big club bias I was probably a better goalie when I was 20 playing for Falkirk than I was 18 playing for Aberdeen but yeah I was in the, the Scotland 21s when I was 18 um, unfortunately I'm too old now for the 21s um, 
but yeah, obviously, my ambition's to one day play for Scotland. I think like any other Scottish player will say the same. So obviously, I need to just keep working hard, I suppose. And who knows, one day, maybe. You know, you touched on before about um, how you feel you're a better goalkeeper at Falkirk at 20 than you were at Aberdeen at 18. There was, we we sort of talked about already slightly, but you moved to our growth in January of 2017. There's also been loans at Dumbarton and I can't pronounce this, but is it Deronavale? <laughs> Devonville. That's, the, that's what I meant. Devonville. Um, <laughs> um, almost every player that I've spoken to that has gone on to have a successful career has had a really good loan spell when they were 18, 19, 20. So how important are loan moves to your progression as a young player? Yeah, massive. It was an eye-opener when I went to Arbroath. So the season before that, I had a nine-month-long injury. Uh, done my kidney and it was a 50-50 in training. And it was actually Frank Ross, who I mentioned earlier. He absolutely done me a belter in training. So my kidney... Let's keep it simple. My kidney burst open. My the one Jesus on my left. Christ! So I was I was bedded for like six months or whatever for that, and I was out playing football for nine months. It was it was brutal. But I mind coming back after that injury, and I played a bounce game for Aberdeen Twenties away to Dundee. And after the game, my goalie coach came up to me and says, "Right, you're going on loan next season." So I came back in for that pre-season. Twenties were away to. Port- Portugal, I think it was, for a pre-season tour, and I got told to stay in Aberdeen because I was going to Arbroath to train with them, and I was thinking, oh, fuck no. There's a bit of a difference between going to Portugal and training and going right in the, the coast to train with Arbroath, but no. For development-wise, it was, it was miles better doing that. So uh, I went to Arbroath for the first half of the season, um, but no, massive eye-opener. Um, I was 17 at the time when I went, and my first game, I played really well. Um, and after that, it probably wasn't the best of loan spells for myself. It was just not what I was used to playing men's football and that. Um, our bro fans probably don't like me because, I'll be honest, I wasn't great when I was there. I wasn't bang average. I was nothing special. But it was such an eye-opener playing men's football, just which I wasn't used to. And... That loan spell, up 15 games or whatever I played, I reckon that's probably what sent me on my way a bit. Playing yeah. that men's football at a young age, it, it was massive in my development. Do you know when you're talking about like um, Scottish football at that level, like I used to love going to not just SPL games, I used to love going to like League One, League Two games if I could get them when I lived up in Scotland. And I've got to be completely honest, it wasn't always for the quality of football, it was for like the crack in the stadium because it was just yeah. vicious but funny. What's the best slash worst insult that you've ever had thrown at you from the stand? Oh, put me in the spot there. <laughs> um, There's always yeah, a few. We, it's not even a bad insult, but we played um, a junior team in the Scottish Cup this year it was on TV for some reason don't know why that game was on TV I think it's because it was only like four miles between the two places yeah but we played them and I was doing the warm up and there was, there was a bunch of bunch of kids in that behind the goal like, and we were just going hey much much I'm like how the hell do you even know who I am it's like you're an Aberdeen reject Aberdeen reject and that and I was like fair play to you for doing your research and that <laughs> I've never I've never really had anything this, this one, to be fair just just banter, to be fair. It's just I, next I level, like isn't it? Way. I like the games yeah. where, uh, obviously, we were playing at a junior's ground and it was so tight, so we're honestly, like, they could put their hands out and touch you if they wanted to. But I like grounds like that, eh, when they're, like, right on top of you and that, and you can hear everything they're saying. I think it's ace. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of the, to me, it's the, the beauty of Scottish football. Like the, my favourite ground in Scotland is Tyne Castle because you're literally right on the players. Yeah, like you're almost Tyne falling Castle. on them. And there's like when that's like, and the one game I actually went to, uh, Tyne Castle, the first game, sorry, was actually against Falkirk a few years ago. I think Hearts had gone, geez, they'd gone the whole season unbeaten and they'd won the week previously 8 0. And it was that season where they like stormed the league and they played Falkirk. Typically, my luck because whoever I go along and support will just get beat. That's like the Sunland curse, really. They got beat 3 2, I think, off Falkirk, but it was a great atmosphere because yeah. it was right next to the Falkirk fans. 
or going after Ian Knox. I think it was Rory Loy was playing up front. Um, yeah. And like, there's a lot of grounds in Scottish football, like you say, where like you can hear absolutely everything. And there's yeah. just, there's a special, it's, it's always really harsh, t- terrible stuff you hear, but it's always took in the best way. And I always find like the insults that just come from like, Scottish fans is just better than any insult anywhere else. Yeah, it's it's like, good. It's, I, I do like Town Castle. I've never, I've never actually played there, but um, I've done the warm up for Aberdeen there yeah. before, and yeah. I found that when you're on the pitch and that everyone's so on top. And no, I'd, I'd agree. Yeah, it's one of my favourite stadiums as well. In cracking stadium, absolutely cracking stadium. Um, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to sort of touch on with uh, your loan move. You talked about Arbroath already, but you won the league when you were Arbroath, didn't you? Well. I was part of the squad that won the league, so I got recalled in January. Um, so I played enough games to get a medal, but <laughs> I'll take it. So I, I do have a medal from from playing with our bro um, that first half of the season. Um, but so no, even though I was average, I still had a couple high moments. As I said, my first game, it was actually it was a four years ago today. It came up on Twitter today. We played Dundee United live in the TV in that BT Sport. Um, we drew one one with them. Um, I got man in match and all. I got interviewed live on BT Sport and that, and that was my first senior game of football. I was like, wow, um, that was probably the problem. Where do you go up from that? It was all yeah. kind of down, downhill from that. You can't really get much higher than that. But no, yeah, that was probably the highest point I had in my our brief career was was that first game. And funnily enough, start of last season with Falkirk. The amount of players that are currently at Falkirk last season that played in that game, it was mental. So you had the two managers at Dundee United, you had the goalie Cammy Bell for United, you had Paul Dixon, Mark Dernan, Charlie Telfer, Aidan Connolly. You had seven players, who, well, seven people that were part of the club at Falkirk last season that were part of that game. So it kind of weird how it all, all worked out and then obviously by your, by your teammates. Talking about Falkirk itself, obviously we touched on a little bit earlier about the current circumstances, but all in all, I think Falkirk are back on the, the upward curve from what's been admittedly a few difficult seasons. Um, how have you found Falkirk? Or like, how are you finding the place, the city, the fans, the club since you've moved? Um, no, I'm really, really enjoying that. It's three years I've been there now. Um, last season was probably my breakthrough season. You can say my first season I played five games in the Championship. Um Last season, well, the season before, the one that's just finished, was a complete write-off for myself. Um, and obviously last season was my breakthrough, but being in the team every Saturday, what a difference it makes to your confidence and your morale and that. And I loved every minute of last season, um, even though it wasn't the way we wanted it to finish. Last season was brilliant and the fans have been really good to me, to be fair. Um, since I've got in the team, I feel like I've... I've done well enough to earn their support in that. So, no, I really, I really did enjoy last season. How does it feel being at a club like Falkirk, who I think are probably, and I don't mean to offend any other club here, but probably the league and the position that they're in at the moment is probably not befitting of Falkirk's history. Um, I think they've, they've well been known as sort of at least, at the very least, a championship club. And we talked about before, they sometimes get, bigger attendances or often get bigger attendances than some Scottish Premiership clubs. Mm-hmm. So it's like, even though it may look like it's Scottish League One, it is, you know, I, I, like I say, I've lived in Scotland, I understand that the pressure that comes with almost every Scottish club. So being 21, being the first team goalkeeper with a club that's gone through a difficult time and now back on the upward curve, is it in a good way quite pressurised and playing for a club like Falkirk with big expectations in the league they're in? Um, well, yeah, the fan base is massive in that... Um and they're not quiet where they know they want the club to be. And yeah. more of the board, to be fair, the board <coughs> often came out and said, this is a premiership club. This club should be in the premiership. So, yeah, you could say there's a bit of pressure on us, but obviously the players in the now is to win League One. And then the next step is to look up. But ultimately, yeah, I'd love to be able to get a club to, well, be part of the team that gets the club to the premiership, obviously. Right now, we've only got about a dozen signed players, so we're a wee bit off that. But yeah, but that is, you could say, my aim as a Falkirk player is to get them up the leagues again. Um, I've been part of the club that got relegated. I didn't play that season, but I was part of it. And 
the change, it's ridiculous. So I'm actually the longest serving player now and I've only been there three years. Um, the amount of players that have been and gone through the club, but honestly, it's no joke. It's around probably 60, 70 players. Yeah. Honestly, the past two and a half years that have been in and out of the club, it's, it's mental. And um, that's three years I've been here and I'm on to my fourth and fifth manager. Obviously, it's joint managers this, this coming season now. But I'm on to them now. So that's, that's three previous managers already that have been and gone. And it's, so there has been a lot of change to the club since I've came in. And um, I must be doing something right because I'm, I'm still here. I'm one of the ones that haven't been, been kicked out yet. So, But no, there has been a lot of change. Talk about the management then. Obviously, there is two managers at Falkirk at the minute. And I was going to ask, you know, how would that differ to having like a normal manager? But... When we spoke before about the, the youth levels and then you were saying there's always more or less two managers that you had at youth levels. Is that, so it's, is it not that unusual having two managers then at a um, first team level because of that? I don't, I don't think it is. Um, that isn't weird anymore. Um, even, you probably don't see it as fans, eh? but like, when it's just a manager and an assistant manager, you, you tend to find that assistant manager takes the majority of the training anyway. So, there's not much difference to both of them having the title as as a manager. It's it is pretty normal. But Lee Miller, he's one of the managers. He he played for Aberdeen, so I've grew up watching yeah. Lee play play football. And my first season at Falkirk, as I said, only played five games. But Lee was at the club as a player. My first season, so I've played with him, watched him, and now he's my manager. Um, so I think it's for me personally, it's good because both of them really rate me which which is good it's what you need as a manager because you often find it's a game of opinions um, so the previous manager I don't think he thought much of me whereas these current ones have came in and have thought the world of me which is which is brilliant for me and my development I suppose What are they like as people? Yeah good um, just like when they're boys in it like in changing but they're good crack. They know when to be serious on a Saturday and that, and they know when to have have a laugh with the boys. We've got a really good mix. And from when they came in in October, it it was it felt like a kind of a turning point in the club. Um, the morale, of the place, kind of just went up up a level, and everyone was just enjoying their work and enjoying playing on a Saturday and that. And the results kind of came with that. I think we've only lost. Two games, maybe, maybe three, and one was yeah. in the cup to a Premiership team in that. So, since they came in, it's really been a turning point, I feel, and I, I feel we would have went on to, to win that league last season. So, I suppose, probably just to touch on and, and sort of final question, and we've maybe spoke about it already, so I'll, I'll try and reword the question as best I can. But, um, hopes for the future, not just for, for Falkirk, but also you individually. Obviously, you're still 21. There's, as a goalkeeper, there's a good 20. 20 years left in you yet so yeah. what is it if you know if we had this conversation in 20 years time what would you have hoped you have achieved Oof. a lot hopefully we'll cut and on. <laughs> short term hopefully obviously staying in the team that's honestly that's my aim at the minute is is staying in the team we can week out for Falkirk and you take a honest step it's winning leagues with Falkirk and then obviously it's it's hopefully getting a a big move somewhere, making the club money, like a transfer fee or whatever, and obviously just constantly working up that, that ladder, you could say, and getting to as, as high as I possibly can. Obviously, it might just be dreams, it might never happen, but at the minute, that's my aim, is just to play at the highest level I possibly can. Like Some some people might look at that right now, especially about our bro fans, and think, he's off his fucking nut, but honestly, that's... that's that's my aim, is to make it as high, high as I can. Perfect. Robbie, thanks very much, mate. Great chat. Not a problem.